some uh, glitches today, but once again, we thank God that uh, we are able to stream this fourth sermon of our series to you, uh, the series being entitled Storms. I do want to start off by wishing all of our moms a uh, happy Mother's Day, whether you're a mom or you are a grandma, uh, or even uh, you have taken it upon yourself to take care of some children and have become a mom to them. We appreciate you, and we just want to wish you a very happy uh, Mother's Day. Why don't we start off together today with a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you that we can be here today, and Lord, even though we have had some uh, glitches with technology, I want to thank you for uh, Alan, uh, a faithful member of our church who is our sound guy, uh, helping us to at least be able to stream this a different way and uh, help me to be comfortable uh, in the different way that we're doing it and help us to do our very best to bring glory to you, Father, because that's what it's all about. Uh, Father, this is a sermon that we desperately need, and it is a sermon that not everyone will automatically understand, but I pray for illumination. I pray you would shed light on the scriptures. I pray that our folks would understand some things right now that they might not have seen before. We love you. We praise you. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Well, as I already uh, said, we are preaching this series on storms, and this is sermon number four, which is entitled, A Solemn Sobering Declaration. Uh, we have a couple of scripture verses to read, John 16 and verse 33. I would encourage you to take some notes, and if you have some questions, uh, might be better if you email me those questions at this point. John 16.33 says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you will have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And this is certainly our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ talking. And then we move to 1 Peter, the fourth chapter. We're going to read together verses 12 through 17. It says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Friends, I don't know about you, I do not appreciate suffering. I do not pray in the morning and say, Lord God, I truly would like to suffer today. I would like some tribulation. I would like some adversity just to spice things up. And uh, if I could see you raising your hands at home, I'm sure that you do not appreciate suffering in your life either. We do all we can to avoid it, to sidestep it. We pray for deliverance, and yet the Word of God will encourage us today to understand suffering uh, just a little bit better. 
Uh, I don't like suffering and I don't understand suffering like the Apostle Paul understood suffering. And uh, you know he had a thorn in the flesh. You know he prayed for it to be removed. But God said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Well, what was the response of Paul? He said, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And that is out of 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 9 and 10. So, Paul got it. Paul understood. Wow, when I suffer, this is a path to glory. This is, su this is sharing in the sufferings of Christ. Christ. When I truly am weak, God tells me that's when I'm strong. So I'm going to get excited over these times when God's power is on me like never before. Now friends, this sermon should help all those who suffer for Jesus' sake. And today's sermon will require a little bit more spiritual depth for some and it'll stretch you a little bit more than you are accustomed to being stretched because no one likes to suffer and we live in a time where the prosperity gospel is preached and people are buying it they don't understand that not everything is to be perfect and there is to be adversity and there is to be a refining process. One writer made this statement. He said, concerning storms, you don't really know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. The first part of our text, John 16 and verse 33, reminds us that in Jesus we will have Peace. Keep that in mind. And then the world is brought to our attention, and there is always a contrast and two directions to be considered. Robert Frost made the statement, two paths emerged out of the woods, and I took the path least traveled, and it has made all the difference. You see, friends, secular, natural, worldly suffering is never seen as necessary. And as we think about storms, we think about suffering. It's never a meaningful part of life. The unsaved world doesn't view it that way. They look at it as an interruption. But God says it's part of of his plan and it's so much my desire today to get that across to you in a way that you would understand that we would embrace suffering we would realize it's part of God's plan it does lead us into a more intimate walk and understanding with God when we go through it with the right mindset God says there's a purpose in our suffering. And one writer said it's like a nail driven deep into the love of God that we receive more stability, spiritual power than you can ever imagine. Suffering will drive you like a nail into the love of God. I think that's pretty exciting. So we're going to notice a couple of things this morning. I hope it'll help you. I hope that you'll be able to pull some scriptures out of this, grow closer to God. Understand this is not downtime. This is non, not non-productive time in our world, in our nation, during this pandemic. This is very special, sweet 
time to get intimate with God, to share in the sufferings of Christ, to realize that this is our path to glory, and God is going to administer some suffering, not as temptation, but as a test to grow us up in Jesus Christ. Please don't tune me out, because some people don't want to hear about suffering. They don't want to hear about adversity and persecution, but friend, we need it if we're ever going to understand the things of God in a more productive way. So, number one, storms should not surprise us. I'm just like you. I cry out, why is this happening? This can't be. Oh, not again. But God says storms should not surprise us. Verse 12 of our text, 1 Peter 4, says, Beloved, so it's speaking to believers, isn't it? This portion of scripture was written to Jewish believers who were suffering persecution and tribulation for their newfound faith. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. Now, friends, contrary to some modern prosperity teaching, membership in Christ's kingdom does not shield us from suffering. Those that preach and teach to you, name it and claim it, you should not be suffering. You should not have physical infirmity. Every infirmity you have physically should, in fact, be healed. Friend, I emphatically state to you this morning, they are heretics. They are promoting damnable heresy. And people enjoy sometimes gathering those kind of teachers, preachers, and promoters to themselves because they want to hear what they want to hear. But friends, we desire to preach and teach truth. And I pray that that is your desire. We are not home yet. We have not been designed for this fallen world. We have eternity that has been set in our hearts. And I know it seems like this is everything. But I assure you, it is not. Paul had a great perspective in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. And this brings a smile to my face. Paul said, For our light affliction, <laughs> which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. Our light affliction? Paul, the apostle, he had stones thrown at him. He was thrown in prison. He was shipwrecked. He was bit by snakes. Is that amazing or what, that he would call his suffering light affliction? Friends, we do not suffer like the rest of the world does for Jesus Christ. We are very seldom persecuted for righteousness' sake. We have it so easy here in the United States of America to promote Jesus Christ. In fact, oft times it is almost a popular thing to follow Christ and to follow the contemporary artists that give forth the music that we love so much. It's enjoyable, it's entertaining. But Paul speaks of his light affliction that's but for a moment, working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. My goodness, I would have to be and you would have to be a student and a believer in the Word of God to swallow that. Well, yeah, you need to be a student and a believer of the word of God to receive truth. 
I would have to trust more in who he is rather than what he does in order to swallow that and to accept that. Yes, you would. But friends, do we want truth or do we want something fabricated that will make us feel good? Don't get me wrong. I always have to throw this in. I love having fun. And most of you that know me, you know that I enjoy having fun. Ah, uh, I like good times. I like pleasant moments. I love being with loved ones. I love being with church family. I love going on vacation. I love all the good stuff that you do. But friends, if this is all that we get to experience in Christ Jesus in this world. I'm like the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. I am of all men most miserable. If God is God and heaven is heaven and glory is glory, it has to be more than this. And you will embrace that more and more the older you get and the more that you focus in on the things of the Lord. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, if you're taking notes, verses 17 through 19, it addresses unbelievers and the things they're involved in, the things they believe, the things they gather to themselves. And I'm not going to read all those verses in verses 17 to 19, but it uses these phrases, futility of mind, your understanding is darkened, you're alienated from God, you're ignorant, you're blind, and yet in verse 20, it refocuses on believers, and it says, but you have not so learned Christ. What have we learned in Christ? We've learned that the way we see things and accept things according to our natural thoughts are not necessarily what the Word of God is teaching. And if we are in love with Him and desire to be intimate with Him, we'll want to know what He's teaching where he's leading, and what we must become as we become more like Jesus Christ. Some scriptures are tough, I know. I admit that. But again, I'm going to trust in whom God is, rather than his methods, rather than what he does. 2 Timothy 2, in verse 12, if you're taking notes, it says, If we endure, we shall reign with Christ. Matthew 24 and verse 13 says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. It doesn't mean that somehow we endure and we persevere and we come out on the other side because of our great endurance and our perseverance. It just means that those that are true believers embrace something Called the doctrine of perseverance. We may falter. We may get discouraged. We may backslide. But true believers will never ultimately forsake Jesus Christ. We will finish. We will come to the end. We will stand in his presence. And it will be worth it all. When we get there, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. So storms should not surprise us. He's the great refiner. He turns up the heat. He tests us so that we might grow. He loves us just the way we are, but he's not willing to leave us there. Secondly, Lightening the load during the storms. Hebrews 12, and let's see, 
Hebrews 12 and verses 1 and 2. Give me just a second to get there. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It says, therefore, and i got to stop at that word therefore, because therefore is basically pointing back to Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the Faith Hall of Fame, the great cloud of witnesses, those who have trusted in Jesus from the beginning of time, and they are called the faithful, and they have died believing in Jesus Christ, either looking forward to his coming or looking back to the Savior who came his death, burial, and resurrection. So when we look at chapter 12, and it says, therefore, it means in light of the faithful in Hebrews 11. We also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 11, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Common sense, when we talk about lightening the load during storms, isn't that what seafaring mariners do? Whether it was those that were on the boat with Jonah, or the disciples that were on small crafts that experienced storms in the New Testament, didn't they lighten the load and throw things overboard when catastrophic events came and storms hit their small craft? Listen, whenever anything is seen in the Word of God as a physical event, there is always a spiritual application. You and I, when storms come into our life, when persecution comes into our life, when adversity comes into our life, God wants to teach us to lighten our load. And it's important that we understand what that means. I've listed a couple of things. We should deny ourselves. Matthew 16 and verse 24, it says, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What are some of the weights? What is some of the sin? mentioned in Hebrews 12, and we need to get rid of it. We need to lighten the load. We also need to put off our old self, our old ways that are mentioned in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. We need to submit our wrath and our anger and our tongue to Almighty God as we lighten the load. During these times, this pandemic, we need to submit ourselves to God. We don't understand everything, but we want to trust in who He is, not in what He does. James 4, 7 says, Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Let's admit it, friends. Sometimes we deviate from the narrow path and the right course that God has set down for us. Sometimes he has to teach us lessons over and over again. But let's keep submitting ourselves to God. Let's keep going back to square one where we can find our help, our power, our source of encouragement, clarity of thought, peace of heart, 
knowing that we're back at the right place to gain understanding. Put aside distractions. We've already mentioned the sin and the weights. 1 Peter 1 and verse 13 says, Therefore, boy, there's that word again, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's progressive. We are moving in the direction of finally being with Jesus Christ. And he is outfitting us right now. And we're co-laborers together with God. We are part of that process. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Gather in the loose thoughts. Get rid of the distractions. Cast down all the arguments and imaginations that take our eyes off the finish line where Jesus is. I heard a quote years ago that stayed with me. It said simply this, Satan's power stops at the edge of my will. Satan's power stops at the edge of my will. If you're able to say not my will, but your will, Lord, even when I don't understand it, Satan's power will cease as you submit yourself to God. <laughs> Ponder that. I hope that you have a sincere desire, not simply to know of God, but to know him intimately. The third thing this morning, trials. Persecutions are necessary storms and paths to glory. Taking notes, Malachi 3.3. God sits as a refiner. He heats things up so that our impurities might come to the surface. And he can skin them off as we become more like Jesus and understand better what we must do during these days that we live in. Job, in Job 13 and verse 15, he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's so interesting, friends. You read Job 1.1 and find out that he was perfect, mature, upright, a man of integrity turned his back on evil. And yet, for some strange reason, God brought suffering into his life because God had something better for Job. Job didn't understand. Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and young Elihu did not understand. They all speculated. But when Job 38 came along, God told them where it was at. And he questioned them. And he spoke to them out of a whirlwind just to show them his power. Friends, I would rather trust in God than try to work out everything on my own. I am finite. You are finite. And he is infinite. 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7, let me read it to you. It says that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Again, friends, if everything about Jesus, heaven, glory, eternity, is only being experienced by what I see now and what I receive now, I'm a miserable guy because it just would not be worth it if there wasn't a perfect heaven and a perfect God 
and joy unspeakable and full of glory and no sorrow and no tears and no death and nothing to separate us from the love of God. Friends, we are not home yet. And Jesus is fashioning. Jesus is perfecting his bride. And one day we will be presented to himself without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. But we have to go through some storms, some tribulation, some adversity. But don't be surprised when you go through those things. You're familiar with James 1 verses 2 through 5, which basically says, Be joyful when you encounter various trials, knowing that by these you gain endurance. And then we're told to let patience have its perfect work, that we may be perfect, that we may be complete, mature, lacking nothing. Like any good parent, God wants us to grow up, and he is fitting us for eternity. What I spoke about as the bride is prepared, Ephesians 5 and verse 27 says that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that we should be holy and without blemish. Let me give you some more verses. I'm just going to read them to you. Philippians 3.10, that I may know him, not know of him, but know him, and the power of his resurrection, and here it comes, the fellowship of, of his sufferings. One of the reasons we suffer is to enter into that form of fellowship with Jesus Christ. You don't hear many sermons about the fellowship of his sufferings. We're told we should not suffer. That's not what the Word of God teaches. 2 Corinthians 1.5 For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. 1 Peter 4 and verse 16 says, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. The Beatitudes, Matthew 5 and verse 10, Blessed are they that suffer persecution for Christ's sake. Listen, friends. Many people suffer because they do dumb things. But it's never wrong to take a hit for Jesus Christ. When you take a hit for Jesus, God says, Blessed are you because of the persecution you're receiving because of Christ." Jesus. It says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those people are what God's all about. And God smiles at you when you share in the sufferings of his son. Do you remember Ananias when he met up with the apostle Paul who was still Saul the persecutor and God instructed Ananias to go to him help him to recover his sight, baptize him. And Ananias said, Lord, you don't understand. This is Saul the persecutor. This could be a trap. This is not a good thing. We're going to end up suffering because of this guy. You know what God said? God said, go. <laughs> After all that, go. Go. For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name to the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things that he must suffer for my name's sake. Acts 9, verses 15 and 16. And in verse 17, thank God, 
Ananias went and he obeyed. Don't jump over that obedience thing. God said, I know what I'm doing. And there's going to be some suffering for Paul. And uh, he's going to proclaim my name. Friends, in closing, has it ever interested you as to why Joseph in the Old Testament suffered? Pretty good guy. Not too much negative spoken about him. He endured such pain and sorrow. Don't you wonder why he suffered? Don't you wonder why Job suffered, who seemed to do everything in the right manner? Don't you wonder why Jeremiah suffered? How come we're not supposed to suffer? How come we feel like it's a disruption and an interruption in our lives when we suffer. This pandemic, this isn't right. I don't like it. It is a sweet time to enter into the sufferings of Christ, to get close to him, to share his word, to talk to others about trusting in who God is rather than what he does. Suffering is mandatory. He is a refiner. Some suffering is good. I have heard parents who have prayed for their kids that they might not have to go through hard times. I never pray that for my kids. They need hard times. But I always pray that they would look up and find their answers from God in how to deal with it and become mature in Him. I have spoken to parents in the last couple of days who have mentioned how their kids are suffering because they're losing out on sporting events and, and other various activities. Friend, most of the time I just smile and I say, I understand because I have kids and I enjoyed all that stuff as a kid and a teenager and a young adult. I understand. But friends, if we're truly Christians who want to understand the Word of God, can't we look at our kids and say, you know what? There will be some hard times. There will be some suffering as we follow the Savior. But son, daughter, grandchild, think about what Jesus went through for you. Are we really enduring that much right now in the United States of America? Why don't we teach Christian philosophy from the Word of God and get our kids to line up with God? We don't need to share with the world, oh, my family is suffering so much, I'm suffering so much, this is such a terrible thing. No, it's not. It's the path to glory. It's fellowship in the sufferings of Christ. It's understanding our Savior better. It's being refined. We need that. This is not all there is. We are being outfitted for heaven. Oh my goodness, friends. I know this is not an easy sermon to digest. But if you attempt to digest it, you'll become more like Jesus. You'll understand God better. You'll look forward to heaven more so than you ever did before. And God will empower your walk and your life. Don't think it's a strange thing when you suffer for the sake of Jesus like something strange has happened to you it's all part of the master's process I assure you he knows what he's doing let's bow for a word of prayer together Father we thank you we thank you Lord for your goodness and Lord we must admit to you we're finite we're fickle we weigh things with human minds and understanding and we don't always get it. But Father, might we trust in the fact that you always get it. 
You know the beginning from the end. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. And Lord, we trust you, but we know we need more faith. We know we need more wisdom. Help us to wake up, Lord. Help us to know when we're listening to the prosperity gospel, when we're listening to things that are heretical in nature, things that are defined as false teaching in your word. Father, might we seek after you and realize that you want to bring us to the end and you want us to end up being that glorious church without spot, without blemish, without wrinkle, and transformed into the image of our Savior. We love you. And we thank you for loving us first. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you, folks, for being with me today. And uh, I'm going to be praying for you that this message will work in your heart. And you'll pray to him and become a little bit more like the Savior. God bless. Have a great day. <laughs>